Today, we're on our way to Cambridge University in Great Britain for an eight-day crusade. Never have I felt so inadequate and unprepared for any task assigned me by the Holy Spirit as I do preaching the gospel to thousands of university students day after day. During the past few weeks, the British newspapers have given a great deal of coverage to the contemplated crusade, and all of Britain has become interested. Thousands of Britishers are asking, will the gospel have the same impact on a university campus that it does on the rank and file of people across the nation? Many British leaders are predicting failure. However, we believe the same Holy Spirit who has honored his word in London and Glasgow will perform miracles at Cambridge University. Therefore, I am asking our friends everywhere to join us in earnest prayer that we may see a spiritual awakening at Cambridge University. Such a religious revival would have a tremendous impact on the entire British Empire, and its effects would be felt even in the United States. I believe it is the duty of Christians everywhere to pray that God will send a great outpouring of His Spirit at Cambridge as we begin our meetings there next Sunday. On exactly the same Sunday, 1882, D.L. Moody began his Cambridge crusade. On the opening night, 1,700 men in cap and gowns were counted entering the building. Some of the audience began to sing rowdy songs. Others began to build a pyramid of chairs. From outside, a firecracker was thrown against a window. When Moody and Sankey entered with several of the other clergy, they were greeted with cheers, jokes, and jeers. After Sankey sang, they began to shout, Hear, hear, encore. Song books were thrown back and forth by students. Some of the ladies present fainted. And finally, the police arrived and cleared part of the hall. But by the time the week was over, great blessing had come and hundreds had found Christ at Cambridge. Out of the Moody meetings came the famous Cambridge Seven, which stirred the missionary world a few years ago. In 1911, R.A. Torrey came to Cambridge and held a week of meetings. Though the meetings did not stir Cambridge nearly so deeply as the Moody meetings, yet God greatly used this American preacher to stir hundreds of students to a new life in Christ. The preparations and interest in the meetings this year at Cambridge are greater than at any time in history. No stone has been left unturned by Christian members of the faculty and student body to assure a sympathetic hearing. Thirty British ministers will be associated with us, and helpers will be there from all over Britain praying and doing personal counseling. Accompanying me on this trip is Dr. David Cowie, the pastor of the University Presbyterian Church of Seattle, Washington. Together, we are praying that God will use us to make a contribution to what we believe could be the most important series of meetings held in recent years. We are counting on your prayers. Today, we continue our discussion of the seven deadly sins. Some people have written in and expressed a doubt as to whether the sins traditionally recognized as the seven deadly sins are really the most dangerous to which we're exposed. Certainly, there are many other sins that are not mentioned in the seven deadly sins, but most church leaders have agreed that almost all sins can come under the seven deadly sins of anger, envy, pride, impurity, gluttony, slothfulness, and avarice. Today, we look at the sin of slothfulness, it comes from the Latin word assidia. As we have discussed this sin, some of my friends have suggested that it is not so much a sin of the present era in which we live as it was in the ancient world. However, the more I thought about it in the preparation of this message, the more I became convinced that it is one of the great sins that is being committed in America today. Webster's Dictionary defines sloth as a disinclination to action or labor, sluggishness, laziness, idleness, and indolence. In theological language, it carries with it the idea of not only laziness in spiritual things, but apathy and inactivity in the practice of religion. The Bible indicates the sin of slothfulness engenders a negative kind of life, which is stagnant and ineffective, and which renders a person unworthy of being a follower of Jesus Christ. Spiritual laziness is not only a sin against God, it is a sin against yourself. It measures the distance between what you ought to be and what you actually are. It shows the difference between the person you are and the person you could be. Slothfulness is the destroyer of opportunity and the murder of souls. It kills steadily and silently, but it kills just the same. The slothful man is like driftwood floating downward with the current, effortlessly and heedlessly. The easy way is the popular way, the broad way, the way of the crowd. It takes no effort, no strength, no manhood to be lost. A drifting boat always goes downstream, never up. A drifting, slothful soul inevitably is drifting toward an eternity of destruction. 
Many a man has lost his life in an automobile accident, not because he was a bad driver, but because he was a good driver asleep. Many persons are fighting losing battles spiritually, not because they are really bad, but because they are spiritually slothful, sleepy, and drowsy. The Bible says, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Many persons have lost their health and their life, not because they have abused their bodies by sin, but because they have neglected them. They were just too lazy to take care of themselves. Slothfulness reaps its annual harvest of thousands of death on the highways, thousands of physical breakdowns, and an and a staggering amount of suffering and misery across the world. The sin of doing nothing has been called in Scripture the sin of omission, which is just as dangerous as the sin of commission. You do not have to do anything to be lost. Just be slothful about your soul. Just do nothing. Jesus said, it is easy to be lost. He said, wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. The Bible has a great deal to say about the blighting, deadening, damning sin of slothfulness. It says, slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep, and an idle soul shall suffer hunger. Again the Bible says, the desire of the slothful killeth him, for his hands refuse to labor. In the parable of the talents given by Jesus, we not only read of the reward of the faithful servant, but of the judgment of the slothful servant. His judgment for doing nothing was as great as the judgment of those that had committed adultery and murder. The Bible says of him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, take thou the talent from him, and cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The chief sin of the ten virgins was not immorality, lying, or cheating. It was slothfulness. They simply neglected to provide themselves with oil. They were judged not for flagrant sin, but for laziness and unfaithfulness. When the bridegroom came, the door of opportunity slammed shut, and the voice of God echoed in judgment, I know ye not. In the parable of the talents, the unprofitable servant had done no outward wrong. He simply was too slothful to carry out the responsibilities which had been assigned to him. His sin was the sin of slothfulness, the sin of doing nothing. In every area of life, the slothful person is the loser. The slothful, lazy student who spends his time loafing on the campus drugstore can never hope to be on the honor roll. Diplomas are usually awarded for faithful work and diligent study, not for native talent or ability. It is usually the person who is willing to work who wins the applause of his professors. On the farm, in business, in the school, in the shop, and in every area of our lives, slothfulness is judged and faithfulness is rewarded. Slothfulness is the destroyer in everyday life. On its account, lives have been lost, cities have been ravaged by fire, and homes have been broken. It has kept the hobo from a life of respectability, the prostitute from living a life of purity, and the thief from being honest. Someone has aptly said, it isn't the thing you do, friend, but the thing you leave undone that gives you a bit of a heartache at the setting of the sun. The encouraging word we might have spoken to a discouraged friend the helpful deed that would have made someone's burden a little lighter, the bit of money pressed lovingly in the hands of the needy. These are the neglected things that bring remorse and rob others of the help they need. When through slothfulness we fail to do that loving deed, Jesus' words of judgment ring in our ears. Inasmuch as ye did it not unto one of the least of these, ye did it not unto me. There are thousands of people who are slothful about church going. They like to sleep late on Sunday morning or go out for a game of golf. Others like to sit at home and read the newspapers and rationalize that they can hear a sermon by radio or watch a religious program on television. They think by thus doing that they have discharged their religious responsibility. There are others who are slothful about their prayer life. Paul said that we are to pray without ceasing. He meant that we were to be in the attitude of prayer at all times. Because we are lazy and slothful, our prayer life is neglected, and thus our spiritual resources are dried up. There are many people listening to my voice who have neglected to pray even today, and as a result, your day has gone all wrong. I have found that if by leaving my room in the morning without spending a period of time in prayer, the day is completely wrong and troubles and problems mount. Most of us would rather have that extra wink of sleep than spend 15 minutes in prayer with God in the morning. We allow everything else to interfere with our appointment with God. If you had an appointment to see the President of the United States or the Queen of Great Britain at a certain hour, I dare say that you would not be tardy or late. You would probably be ahead of time and deeply concerned about how you were dressed and what you would say to so distinguished a person. Yet we are continually late and tardy in our daily appointment with God. 
We never prepare our minds or hearts for the period of prayer. We usually give God the odd moment or the last moment before we retire when we're so sleepy that we cannot keep our minds on what we're doing. We're guilty of the sin of slothfulness. There are thousands of Christians that are also guilty of slothfulness in Bible reading. The Bible teaches that we are to desire the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. The reason many Christians are not growing is that they're not reading the Bible. And the reason they're not reading the Bible is that they're too slothful. The psalmist said that he meditated in the laws of God day and night. And as a result, God's words were like honeycomb to his heart and soul. Many of you are wondering why you do not have the thrill and joy of Christian experience that you know others have. It is because you are not reading the Bible. You are guilty of the terrible sin of slothfulness. You are leaving undone those things you ought to have done. There are many others that are slothful about witnessing for Christ. How long has it been since you spoke to a soul about Christ? How long has it been since you won another person to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? There are scores of people that you contact every day that need the Savior, and yet not one word has ever escaped your lips trying to win them to know Christ. You are guilty of the sin of slothfulness, and others will be lost because you are guilty of this sin. There are others who are slothful in the way they live. It is a sin to be slothful in your dress, in your conversation. It is sinful to be slothful in the ordinary courtesies of everyday life. The sin of slothfulness extends into many areas, such as being slothful about your driving habits on the highway that endangers the lives of others, being slothful about your personal cleanliness, which is next to godliness, being slothful about the smile that should be upon the face of every Christian at all times, no matter what the circumstances, being slothful about helping those who are in need in your neighborhood, being slothful about giving to charity in order that the unfortunate and the underprivileged may have the necessities and cares of life. There are others that are slothful in giving of their tithes and offerings to the kingdom of God. If the average business kept books the way the average Christian keeps books in relation to his debts and gifts to God, it would go bankrupt within a few days. There are many of you listening to my voice that realize the tremendous ministry that the Hour of Decision has. This radio program is heard over 900 radio stations. Our newspaper column that preaches the gospel daily is read by millions of people in over a hundred great newspapers in the nation. Our television program in Great Britain is seen on Sunday nights by millions. Our Christian literature is sent to every part of the globe, winning hundreds and thousands every year to Christ. Our films are being seen by thousands weekly, and every week hundreds walk down the aisles to receive Christ at some showing of one of our evangelistic films. All of this takes money to support and finance. God has laid it upon the hearts of many of you time after time to help and become a part of this great ministry. Your duty toward this ministry is just as great as mine. The Bible warns in Isaiah 56:10, His watchmen are blind. They're all ignorant. They're all dumb dogs. They cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. They were guilty of the sin of slothfulness. There are thousands of Christians who are slumbering and keeping their mouths shut while the world is in desperate need of the gospel of Christ. The scripture again warns, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. There are many ways that you can serve Christ, no matter what your circumstances. You can have just as much a part in this evangelistic ministry as I, Cliff Barris, Beverly Shea, or any other member of our team. You can become a partner with us in presenting the gospel. The New Testament continually warns against the sin of slothfulness, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Martin Luther wrote in one of his sermons, the devil held a great anniversary at which his emissaries were convened to report the results of their several missions. I let loose the wild beast of the desert, said one, on a caravan of Christians, and their bones are now bleaching in the sands. What of that, said the devil, their souls were all saved. I drove the east wind, said another, against a ship freighted with Christians, and they were all drowned. What of that, said the devil, their souls were saved. For ten years I tried to get a person to be at ease about his soul, and at last I succeeded, and he is ours, said another. Then the devil shouted, and the night stars of hell sang for joy. The sin of slothfulness and criminal spiritual neglect have probably done as much to populate hell as the vicious sins we hear so much about. It seems so harmless, so innocent, and yet its venom is more deadly to the spirit of man than some of the most hideous sins to which men are addicted. 
The worst thing that that slothfulness does is to rob a man of spiritual purpose, the power of Christian decision, in stupidity and indolence. This spiritual drowsiness renders him incapable of choosing Christ. He may give mental assent to the truth. He may even know the doctrines of religion, but he is incapable of positive action. The road is clear before him. He knows the way he should go. But slothfulness has made his will soft and irresponsible. This sin must be confessed like any other. The Bible says, To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin. In the crowd of people who gathered around the cross of Christ, there were those who have committed the sin of slothfulness. Even though Christ the Son of God was dying, it says of them, Sitting down, they watched him there. Such indifference, such unthinkable sloth. But just before Jesus breathed his last breath, he looked at the sinners all around him. The thieves, the murderers, the gamblers, the hypocrites, the profane, the immoral, the proud, the envious, the greedy, the gluttonous, and the slothful. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In that moment, the Lamb of God, to everyone who would believe, took away the sins of the world. By that redemptive, consummate act, he opened up the way to heaven. Eternal life is within reach of everyone. He is as near as your yielded will, or he is as far away as you want him to be. Your own stubborn, slothful spirit is your greatest hindrance to letting him come into your heart. To every man, there openeth a way, and ways and a way. And the high soul climbs the highway, and the low soul gropes the low. And in between, on the misty flats, the rest drift to and fro. But to every man there openeth a highway and a low, and every man decideth the way his soul shall go. Which way is your soul going to go today? I beg of you to acknowledge your sin, renounce your sin, receive Christ as your Savior, let him forgive you, and give you strength and power and supernatural resource to live a victorious Christian life. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, for all of us that are guilty of the terrible sin of slothfulness, we pray that thou wouldst forgive and cleanse us. For all who by slothfulness have neglected Christ, we pray that today they will receive him as Savior and Lord and live the most glorious life that man can know. For we ask it in his name. Amen.